Firstly, I want to thank you for coming out. It's a terrible uh, night, and it's a uh, larger crowd than I thought uh, would be here because of the uh, weather. <clears throat> what I uh, think I'm going to do is um, talk for 10 or so minutes and then take your questions. You can ask me anything you want. I wrote this book long before the Senate race, so it has nothing to do with the Senate race involving uh, Hillary. I hope it has an impact that's helpful to Hillary, but it wasn't intended for that purpose. While I'm sure that uh, the uh, mayor uh, doesn't view our disagreements in the way I do, which basically uh, my attitude uh, is it's substantive. I'm distressed with him substantively, the way he's run the city. And he's done a lot of good things. But it's not personal on my part. And so when I meet uh, the mayor, as I do occasionally at some social event, I don't feel ill at ease, and neither does he. And we chat uh, momentarily, and uh, I don't know what's in his head, but I am not uncomfortable at that moment. I'm the last of the three term mayors. I know a lot about this city. There have only been three three term mayors LaGuardia, Wagner, and me. And when I lost running for a fourth term to David Dinkins, I immediately said he won fair and square, and I'm going to help him get elected. And he said at the time that without my help, he wouldn't have been elected. The reason is simple. 42% of the people in the Democratic primary voted for me. And your supporters are much more angry than you are when you lose. And if I had not encouraged them to vote for David Dinkins, a large number would have either not voted at all or would have voted against him. But I said, no, it's not fair. I would have expected him to vote for me and to campaign for me, and I'm sure he would have, and I'm going to do the same for him. He won. He's a very nice man. He was a terrible mayor. I think he concluded that his job was done being the first black elected mayor in the city of New York. And he simply did not put the time and the effort and the commitment into running the city, as I perceived the city needed running. And then when in his last year, there was what I call then, call now, and will always call, a pogrom in Crown Heights, where a black mob ran through the streets uncontrolled for three days, killing one person because he was a Jew. The mob yelled at him, Jew, Jew, kill the Jew. That was documented. And 80 Jews were assaulted, and hundreds of properties owned by Jews were vandalized simply because they were Jewish. It was a shock. And I said to myself, I cannot support David Dinkins when he runs for re-election. And he ran for re-election in 1993, again against Rudy Giuliani. Giuliani called me and had lunch with me perhaps, I don't know, three, four, five, six times. His campaign chairman uh, was uh, David Garth, who had been mine. We're very good friends, David and I, still to this day. And when I met with uh, Giuliani, he's a very charming man. Much more charm than he's given credit for in personal conversations. He sought my advice. I've always taken the position did then, do now, 
that I have an obligation, moral obligation, to provide whatever information I have to any mainstream candidate. It doesn't make any difference to me what party they belong to. So long as they're in the mainstream, I'll give them advice if they ask me for it. And people do all the time. And there came a point then where he asked me to support him. And I said, I have a problem with you, Rudy. Let me tell you what my problem is. Why in God's name did you put into handcuffs the three stockbrokers that were arrested in their offices? They weren't running away. They weren't threats. And he said, I had nothing to do with that. That was done by the marshals. I don't currently believe him. I wanted to believe him then. So I said, okay. And then I said, and why would you permit a daughter to tape record her mother, for the purposes of criminal prosecution, that was Sucre Cable. You may remember the trial. And, uh, he said, I didn't do it. She did it by a mistake. I told her not to do it. Well, I wanted to believe him, so I didn't pursue it. And I did support him. And without the support of four people, of which I was one, he could not have won. The four people were David Garth, who was the media guru, Ray Harding, who was the Liberal Party chairman who gave him the line, and there are many Democrats who couldn't ever have voted for Rudy on a Republican line, but could on a Liberal Party line. And in fact, he wouldn't have won without the Liberal Party line. Bobby Wagner, who did a magnificent commercial telling Democrats they wouldn't die if they voted for a Republican. And me, because I was popular and I was out there campaigning for him. And he acknowledged as much. What is interesting with respect to our break is how late it came. It came two years later in December of 1995. And in the prologue to the book, which is about 5,000 words, I point out that the columns that I wrote in his first year of office were all positive. And in the second year, 95, while occasionally I would warn him about hubris and doing what he should do, and, uh, but always uh, by way of chiding, never by way of breaking with him, most of those columns were positive or chiding. And it was only until he destroyed the merit judicial selection system, which I had created in the first year of my administration, which took all politics out of the selection of judges and their reappointment, and he changed that without going into all the details. The details are in the book brought politics back into the selection of judges. And that I could not accept. For 12 years, we were selecting judges and reappointing them without any politics. And David Dinkins continued it for an additional four years, 16 years, and Rudy changed it. And I broke with him. 
Now, the title. I think the title is pretty clever, and I'm the one uh, who created it. And I thought it fit. Rudy Giuliani, nasty man. Now, he's off times, and I think unfairly, charged as a racist by people who know that's the worst thing you can call someone in New York City. And he's not a racist. He's mean to everybody. <laughs> and it's not on the basis of race or ethnicity. It particularly affects blacks and Hispanics because, you know, there are very few black elected officials at high positions in New York. Call McCall, state controller. And he won, without question, by vote, white votes. But of course, blacks voted for him overwhelmingly. And Virginia Field, who is the borough president of Manhattan. They are the two highest elected black officials in the city, even though Carl is the state controller. And they both asked Rudy Giuliani to meet with them. Now, there's no question that they represent people without regard to race, whites and Hispanics and Asians and blacks. And they do it very well. And I supported both of them. In fact, as I did uh, television commercials for both of them at their request. But they also have a special obligation to speak out for blacks. Because there aren't very many people speaking out for blacks. And when they ask to meet with the mayor and he says no, or doesn't even say anything and just won't meet with them. And why? And they asked for a meeting for each of them for well over a year. And it was only uh, when he was near the edge of riots as a result of police brutality uh, situations that he finally did meet with them. He didn't want to meet with them because they're critical of him. And for him, any critic must be destroyed. They're enemies of the people. I'm sure that's the way he perceives me. In fact, I think also that he may not even understand why I'm angry. Because it's not personal. In my head, it's not. It's substantive. Now, I'm going to conclude with this. He's a good mayor. I have always said that. I, I have said uh, that I, in fact, uh, agree with him on substantive matters 80% of the time, but disagree with him on implementation 90% of the time. He's a terrific police commissioner, but we didn't elect him to be the police commissioner. We elected him to be the mayor to appoint the police commissioner. And when he did appoint a very fine police commissioner, Bill Bratton, and Bill Bratton is the one who put the technology and the personnel into effect that brought crime down, Rudy could not accept the fact that everybody knew it and that Time magazine put Bill Bratton on its cover and Rudy does not share glory. He has said publicly, and he has said privately, and I was there, I run the police department. That's what he said to me. When I warned him that Bill Bratton's going to leave, you can't treat him this way. I run the police department. I thought to myself, this is nuts. Mayors are not supposed to run the police department. They're supposed to pick a police commissioner and if he doesn't do a good job, fire him. And if he does a good job, the credit that the mayor gets is to say, I appointed this guy. You know, I ran an administration I'm quite proud of. P. 
people knew who the commissioners were because I wanted them to get credit for their good works. Nobody knows who the commissioners uh, are uh, for the most part in the Giuliani administration. And the commissioners don't want anybody to know because they're scared to death they'll lose their jobs if somebody were to say, you know, that's the commissioner and he did a very good job. Oh, God, that scares the commissioner to death. So that's where we are. Now I'll take your questions. It's a good book, by the way. And I wrote every word of it. Every word of it. Yeah. I followed your advice and I voted for David Jenkins. Yeah. And then I walked around saying, we have a mayor for the Jews. We have a mayor for the Italians. We have a mayor for the blacks. We have a mayor for every ethnic group known to man. He's making a mosaic and putting people into groups. And somehow, whether it was true or not, we always felt that the melting pot was what we were striving for. And then I voted for Giuliani on the liberal line. I couldn't, as a lifelong Democrat, vote on the Republican. Well, why, did you, why did you move away from uh, David Dinkins? He was driving my city apart. He was he separating was you, separating us I and I live in oh. an extremely diverse neighborhood yeah. Inwood Inwood is extremely diverse yeah, I where I am I and all of a sudden it was oh we have a mayor for Slavic affairs we have a mayor for this you don't mean you mean a staff person is that what it, you mean? Um, deputy mayors no, there, there were no deputy that's mayors. what he called them well there were no deputy mayors for uh, Slavs or Italians or Jews there weren't I uh, he called them but they had for different, right. different okay. groups all right. I felt that all of a sudden the city that I was born in Manhattan yeah. was going wasn't my city anymore okay. I visited San Francisco and said so how do you feel now about Giuliani now I don't like the way he steps on things People. You don't like the way he steps on people. But I have to admit, yeah. I'm not afraid to come home late at night. Right. I feel the city is safer. It is. I feel Every that... city in America is safer. It's yeah, true. I and I, I don't think... want to take any credit away from Giuliani uh, that he has uh, done a good job. We have he more didn't streets do it? on the police. We have more police on the streets. You have more police on the street because David Dinkins secured the legislation that allowed the city to hire 38,000 cops instead of the 28,000 cops that were there when I and David Dinkins was uh, the mayor. But the other mayor. thing is, there's a feeling even among people who are visiting the city yeah. that it's better. It is, sure. I Listen, mean, don't you know, take that away from I him. don't take it away from him, but it's not enough. The fact is, you know who supports him avidly? The rich and the people who want to be rich. They see police and sanitation as the most important aspects of civic living because they, in large part, leave town. They have another house to go to. The people who don't like him are the people who have to deal with the city. You know, the budget. The huge budget is $32 billion. It's the fourth largest, largest budget in the country. More than half of it goes to about 25% of the people in the city. You know, who goes to public schools today? Only poor people, with rare exception. I think that uh, the only uh, kids uh, who are white left in the public schools today uh, are about 17% if you take them all, and that includes the elementary schools, if you, uh, in the high schools, very few white kids go to the high schools. Very few. Take it from me. The fact is that they've pulled them out, and the schools today are over 80% black and Hispanic, the population, and then a substantial number of Asians, uh, etc. So it's a minimum of 83, 85% non-white. That gets 25% of the budget of the city of New York. 25% of $32 billion. The other 25%, making up half of the budget, is for the uh, HRA. That is all the social programs. 
uh, the people who basically um, participate in those social programs overwhelmingly uh, black and Hispanic. Blacks and Hispanics represent 60% of the city's population today. Six so. And they don't like the way they're treated. And let me just tell you, you know, it, it's really funny. I mean, uh, blacks and Hispanics love me today. They should have loved me when I was running. Because I was a very good mayor, and I didn't believe in preferential treatment based on race. I believed in preferential treatment based on economics. If you were poor, you deserved the help of the city, whether you were black or white. And I'm opposed to all preferential treatment based simply on color. And when I said that years ago, that was like a mortal sin for a liberal to say that. I don't know if you remember that. Boy, did I take a lot of uh, beating. Today, everybody, for the most part, agrees that that's true. There's, there are ways uh, to uh, make up for it. You can treat uh, someone who has overcome poverty and say, well, that person uh, overcame uh, discrimination. Let's help them. But that applies to whites as well as uh, blacks. Uh, you can reward leadership, white or black. But you can't simply say, because you're black, you deserve preferential treatment, and if you're white, you have to suffer uh, uh, what you've been going through. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I'm, I think I speak for all of us to say I'm certainly glad you used your Hagstroms to get here. Uh, concerning the... Uh, What's that mean? Your Hagstrom. No, I know what you're talking a about. Little That's levity. a joke, right? Yeah, okay. yes. All right. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned talking. the chronological occurrence of your book appearing coincidentally at this time all of uh, all of us uh, whatever political persuasion yeah. I would think would want the best uh, senator for New York yeah. State that we can possibly get right uh, and it would be regrettable if the Democratic candidate incurred a lot of resentment because of allegations of carpetbagging James Buckley, notwithstanding Bobby Kennedy, notwithstanding. What's, what's the point? The point? I, it occurs to me that that Giuliani, despite his alleged yeah. uh, sins, uh, might be a better senator than okay. perhaps uh, uh, Hillary if she runs. All right, the answer to that is very simple. This is going to be a very close race. But I believe uh, that uh, Senator Moynihan summed it up. He was said he was told, you know, Giuliani is running for your seat. He said, "Oh my God," he said. The Senate is no place for group therapy. That's what he said. Now, what did he mean by that? What he meant by that, aside from the obvious aspect, is that Giuliani can't work with anybody. I mean, he's a uh, he walks to his own beat, his own march, and you don't like it, you're an enemy of the state. Uh, if he could destroy you, he'll destroy you. Uh, that's not the way you uh, get anything done in the United States Senate. You got a hundred prima donnas there. And a hundred prima donnas means that you got to be respectful, and you have to sit down and work out compromises, and you have to say, well, I know your problem, and I... That's not Giuliani. When the best illustration uh, in addition to what I've mentioned to you, the taxi uh, drivers. You remember Giuliani said, I want them to have more insurance. I agreed with him. They don't have enough insurance. I want them to do six different things. Absolutely, I agree with them. Taxi drivers said, we'd like to meet with you because all of these things cost money and you haven't provided any additional money, so we're going to have a reduction in our income when we conform with your new regulations. We want to meet with you and say to you, we're only making $400 a week, and we're putting in 60 hours a week to make it. And he said, no. And the police commissioner, who wouldn't open his mouth if Giuliani uh, didn't uh, permit it, he said, these are taxi terrorists. Do you remember that? You don't remember. It's a short memory. Okay. But that's exactly what he said. That's exactly what he said. And then they prevented them 
from even demonstrating. They had to go to court. Don't you remember that? I mean, there are maybe a half a dozen uh, organizations uh, uh, that had to go to court simply to get a permit to demonstrate. Even take what he did with uh, Khalid uh, Muhammad. Khalid Muhammad is the scum of the earth. You know who I'm talking about. He was the scum of the earth last year. He's the scum of the earth this year. But the First Amendment applies to the scum of the earth. Well, you say no, but the fact is, if the First Amendment only applied to people that you like, then you don't need the First Amendment, right? I mean, who's gonna bother someone you like? First Amendment is there to protect the point of view that you don't like. And I certainly don't like Khalid Muhammad's point of view. He uh, is anti-white, he's anti-Semitic, he's an awful person. First Amendment says you can rant and rave so long as you don't engage in a physical act of violence. What did Giuliani say? We're not going to give you a permit. This was last year. So they had to go to court, and the court said, oh, yes, you will. And a permit was granted, and they had 6,000 people come, and it was a total failure, except for the notoriety that Giuliani gave it. And then Giuliani and the courts have acknowledged this. He's as responsible for that riot as is Khalid Muhammad, maybe more so. You can't have helicopters flying over people uh, as though this is Vietnam and uh, they're the Viet Cong. You can't have uh, cops rushing in when the permit says, uh, it, the permit uh, ends at four o'clock, rush in at 401 and uh, uh, turn off uh, all the instruments and uh, uh, threaten the crowd. You can't do that. You don't do it with anybody else. And I'm not defending the scum of the earth. I'm simply saying you would think he'd be smarter than that. You would think that he would have learned from last year not to oppose the permit. He didn't, and they had to go to court again and get another permit. Would Hillary be more effective? Listen, listen, I don't know. How do I know whether she will be or she won't be? I think she will be, and uh, we'll find out after she's given the opportunity. Yeah. yeah okay. You said you don't know Giuliani is a racist. No, I don't. But isn't the message he's giving, and not very subtly, to the white people, stick with me and I'll make sure that blacks and Hispanics stay in their place. Well, I know that's what the charge is, but I do not believe, and I think it's terribly unfair uh, to uh, attack him as a racist. And the answer is, he's nasty to everybody. Everybody. And it has nothing to do with the color of your skin. It has to do with whether or not you tell him what he wants to hear. And if you tell him what he doesn't want to hear, you're an enemy of the people. Yeah. When in essence, it is a personal attack. It's a personal attack against this small character. Uh, if you want to put it that way, I'm not going to fight with you. Uh, uh, my attack relates overwhelmingly to his character. Yes. Um, because I've told you that 80% substantive I, I agree. I don't like the way he tries to implement them. I don't know if, uh, you know, you forget all the things you say. When the, when, for example, the, uh, before I came into office, ABEAM uh, uh, had a program uh, which was that if the uh, city uh, demolished buildings, that the local community could turn them into gardens. And they were given leases to do that. I did that too. And the understanding was that when the city was in a position to build another house there so that people would be housed, that the garden would have to be destroyed. I knew that even though everybody said, oh, yeah, we understand that, that when you came to take the property, even for 
a new apartment building that there would be resistance, but at least it was rational. Giuliani said, we're not gonna build. We're gonna sell these properties to speculators. No obligation for the speculators to build, just to hold the property, and property increases in value because there's a limited amount of property in the city of New York. And people said, don't do this. We got these glorious gardens. They're like lungs in a squalid community. And he said, no, we're going to do it. And they said, we want to meet with you. And his response was, these people are still living in a communist era. That's what he said. It's to demonize them. I mean, they must be communists because they want to have a garden. That's why people are so upset. And you know who saved those gardens? The Rose. The Rose. Um, Bette Midler, and who I think is terrific. She yep. is. And she took, I think, $3 million out of a trust fund that she had created, and she bought the properties. Many of them, not all of them. And uh, she deserves uh, canonization, yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah, by the way, you were a great boss. I worked for you for 12 years, many moons ago. Are you uh, worked for the city? I'm an, yeah, an ex-city an ex worker. Oh, good. Uh, by selling va uh, vacant land, aesthetic as it may be, mm. uh, uh, full of uh, shrubbery and, mm. and, and, and such, and a good friend of mine is a green gorilla, uh, I, I, the Liz Christie Garden is magnificent, and it's remained untouched and yeah. not, not sold. What, what's so heinous uh, f f to obtain revenue by selling uh, land okay, right. and I, 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 I got you. I got your picture. Listen, if, if I got your picture. Listen, the city of New York has a $2 billion surplus. It's all due to Wall Street. Someday it'll all be gone. But at the moment, we have a $2 billion surplus. And what they expect to get for this land is $3 million. You're going to tell me that you close up gardens simply to take in $3 million when you got a $2 billion surplus and what you're losing? I think there's something wrong with that. Now, maybe you don't, but I believe uh, that um, there is, city, you see, should be uh, careful of its monies. I like to think so, too. But we're not in the business of business. We're in the business of providing services. And one service that you provide is a sitting area, a garden, a park. So I think he was dead wrong. Who else? Uh, back there. The times are really good right now, and I'm not sure if Giuliani's character means so much to people. What's it going to take for people to see? I mean, even, well, I, the, even I, the New York Times tried to, to yeah. show Giuliani as, quote, the nasty man who's trying to turn to the nicer candidate. Listen, but when times are good, people don't seem to pay attention to say nuances this, like that. Uh, if the election were held tomorrow, I believe that Giuliani would uh, win the Senate race. But I believe in the long run that Hillary can win the Senate race. I actually spoke with her today. Somebody gave her the book and she called me up <laughs> to thank me. <laughs> uh, uh, I told her there are three areas that she ought to concentrate on. One is on national health care and comprehensive uh, medical insurance. And I said the, what you have to do is to tell people that you mucked it up the last time, but the problem is still here, and uh, that there are 43 million people without health insurance, and when uh, she mucked it up, there were only 32 million <laughs> people. So the problem is to be dealt with. And she knows a lot, and she won't make the same mistakes. And she said, you're right. And she has already, uh, over the last uh, 
several months, uh, said that she had made many errors in that area. I said the second uh, area that you have to deal with is education. And uh, you'll have to get your experts, but I want to tell you what I would have as part of the educational program. You have to put back testing on a regular basis. And when I went to school, every Friday you were tested. Yes. Today, you tell a kid he's going to be tested, uh, you're lucky if he doesn't jump out of a window and he's so frightened. So the way to handle that is to tell the students in elementary, high school, we're going to test you for the next six months every Friday, but we're not going to keep the scores. You're going to get them, and they're not going to be entered against you. And when you become proficient in taking tests, that's what it requires. There's a, a way to take a test. It's a frame of mind. Most people uh, tighten up. You have to teach people how to take a test. So in six months, they'll start taking tests that'll count. She said, it's a good idea. Of course, anything I would say is a good idea at this point. In any event, the third issue I said to her is race relations. And the race relations issue, in my judgment, is to be handled simply by promoting respect for other people. Not preferential treatment. Respect. Blacks are not provided respect that they deserve. And whether it's the uh, taxi cab syndrome of hard, you know, get a hard, hard getting a cab or a whole host of uh, things where the respect is lacking, that's got to be addressed. And whatever else she wants to uh, add to that. So she's hopefully going to take my advice. I hope. Who else? Yeah. You, you spent a lot of time uh, in, in police refor reform, um, and there's always a, a line between public order and, but I mean, I remember Commissioner M Murphy both during his tenure in the city and then at the, at the police foundation promoting proper training of, of police so there wasn't community confrontation. Yeah. And um, Mayor Giuliani's taking zero tolerance from uh, a policy of, of enforcing quality of life infractions to, in, in some respects, creating a, a, a climate of, of fear, even though I don't think that was his, his in, intent. Uh, how do you, okay, with, with your experience, how do you relate to the yeah. public order in the city? And sure. The major fault of the mayor at this point is that he refuses to acknowledge that there is a problem of major proportions in the police department with respect to brutality and corruption. The U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District, Zachary Carter, has made an investigation of the police department and he has concluded that brutality is endemic, systemic, and that what is required is an independent monitor. And Rudy Giuliani refuses to accept that. The city council had voted for an independent monitoring commission, and Rudy has fought it in the courts. There will ultimately be one. And I hope that Zachary Carter applies to the courts for the appointment of such a monitor. I think that I'm not overstating it when I tell you that the cops like me. And I think the world of cops. They're really extraordinary people. That doesn't mean that there aren't cops who are crooks and cops who are brutal, but not the vast majority. 
So when I say these things, cops don't get angry with me. They like me better than Giuliani. And I always took the position that cops are entitled to a presumption of regularity when they engage in force needed to subdue someone engaged in a violent act. And that unless the facts were clearly to the contrary, that would be the rebuttable presumption that I would have. But when the facts are to the contrary in your face, Rudy doesn't accept it. Doesn't show the anger. So you had three cases that really had enormous impact on the population of this city, particularly the minority population. Anthony Baez in the Bronx about two and a half years ago, when a police officer angry that Baez had thrown a football that struck his police car, went over and put a chokehold on his neck and killed him. And he was acquitted in the criminal courts and then the federal U.S. attorney moved in and he was found guilty and sentenced to seven years. Rudy didn't act well in that area. Then you had the Luima case of the sodomy. And again, there wasn't the response on the part of the city that was needed. And you've had two convictions there, and I think four other officers have to be retried. And then you had the Diella case, where an innocent black man going to his own home at 2 o'clock in the morning without any gun or knife is shot at 41 times by four cops. and struck with 19 bullets. On the face of it, it doesn't make any sense. You don't shoot someone who's standing in the foyer 41 times. So, now maybe something will come out of the trial uh, that we're not familiar with. But for me, there's no presumption that the cops were good guys in that particular case. Why don't I stop here? Let's sell some books. <laughs> I'd like to thank His Honor thank for coming. You. Through the streets, uncontrolled, for three days, killing one person because he was a Jew. The mob yelled at him, Jew, Jew, kill the Jew. That was documented. And 80 Jews were assaulted, and hundreds of properties owned by Jews were vandalized simply because they were Jewish. It was a shock. And I said to myself, I cannot support David Dinkins when he runs for re-election. And he ran for re-election in 1993 again against Rudy Giuliani. Giuliani called me and had lunch with me perhaps, I don't know, three, four, five, six times. His campaign chairman uh, was uh, David Garth, who had been mine. Firstly, I want to thank you for coming out. It's a terrible uh, night, and it's a larger crowd than I thought uh, would be here because of the uh, weather. <clears throat> what I uh, think I'm going to do is um, talk for 10 or so minutes and then take your questions. You can ask me anything you want. I wrote this book 
long before the Senate race, so it has nothing to do with the Senate race involving uh, Hillary. I hope it has an impact that's helpful to Hillary, but it wasn't intended for that purpose. While I'm sure that uh, the uh, mayor uh, doesn't view our disagreements in the way I do, which basically uh, my attitude uh, is it's substantive. I'm distressed with him substantively, the way he's run the city. And he's done a lot of good things. But it's not personal on my part. And so we're very good friends, David and I, still to this day. And when I met with uh, Giuliani, he's a very charming man. Much more charm than he's given credit for in personal conversations. He sought my advice. I've always taken the position, did then, do now, that I have an obligation, moral obligation, to provide whatever information I have to any mainstream candidate. It doesn't make any difference to me what party they belong to. So long as they're in the mainstream, I'll give them advice if they ask me for it. And people do all the time. And there came a point then where he asked me to support him. And I said, I have a problem with you, Rudy. Let me tell you what my problem is. You are when you lose. And if I had not encouraged them to vote for David Dinkins, a large number would have either not voted at all or would have voted against him. But I said, no, it's not fair. I would have expected him to vote for me and to campaign for me, and I'm sure he would have, and I'm going to do the same for him. He won. He's a very nice man. He was a terrible mayor. I think he concluded that his job was done being the first black elected mayor in the city of New York. And he simply did not put the time and the effort and the commitment into running the city, as I perceived the city needed running. And then when in his last year there was what I call then, call now, and will always call, a pogrom in Crown Heights where a black mob ran. So when I meet uh, the mayor, as I do occasionally at some social event, I don't feel ill at ease, and neither does he. And we chat uh, momentarily, and uh, I don't know what's in his head, but I am not uncomfortable at that moment. I'm the last of the three term mayors. I know a lot about this city. There have only been three three term mayors LaGuardia, Wagner, and me. And when I lost running for a fourth term to David Dinkins, I immediately said he won fair and square, and I'm going to help him get elected. And he said at the time that without my help, he wouldn't have been elected. The reason is simple. 42% of the people in the Democratic primary voted for me. And your supporters are much more angry than